Uh, tonight, uh, Ricky, who gave a very good talk about uh, different British beer types on Tuesday, is going to talk about uh, a nano brewery um, and uh, subtitled How to Turn Your Hobby into a Profitable Business. Um, any of you who don't know what a nano brewery is, I think we'll find out in the talk. But I was sort of just looking at definitions. Um, you probably all know what milli, milli is a thousandth of something, and micro is a, 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 a thousand thousandth of something or a millionth of something. A nano is a thousand millionth of something, or if you're American, it's a billionth of something. So it's a very, very small undertaking. But uh, having seen what uh, Ricky's built, it's very impressive as well. So I'll pass over to you, Ricky, and uh, look forward to hearing what you're going to say. Great. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Um, so, yeah, let, let me at least start by uh, a little little apology uh, and then I'll introduce the business itself. Um, but uh, for those of you that are actually managing to see it, a lot of the top of my head and my, my receding hairline shining in the evening sunshine, uh, I just figured kind of it would make more sense for you to see some of the brewery that we've set up than necessarily to see a lovely picture of my face. So my apologies if sometimes I'm looking down and not looking up at you. Um, it's simply the fact I think the, the, the brewer is a little bit more interesting than I am. Um, so uh, with that, let me talk a little bit about what it is that I've got here uh, and why and how I got started. Uh, and then I will uh, diversify into talking a little bit more about uh, how we got started, some of the challenges of doing what we've done. Uh, and uh, I will uh, stop periodically as I go through for questions and so on. I know that uh, uh, last time I did this talk to some Cambridge home brewers, there were some people who were thinking of setting up their own brewery. Uh, and so I answered a lot of, of, of questions in relation to that. Um, so who are we and what are we doing and why are we doing it? Um, so the answer is we are Burwell Brewery. We are not surprisingly uh, in Burwell in Cambridgeshire. So uh, on the road between Cambridge uh, heading out to Fordham, uh, we are about uh, 10 miles from the centre of Cambridge in the village of Burwell. Uh, the brewery itself is actually in my back garden. Um, the reason it's in my back garden is one really of, of logistics, which I'll talk about. Um, and uh, we are a nano brewery. That means to say we're kind of a big out of control homebrew setup. <laughs> um, you can see the, the brewing vessels behind me. Um, so uh, breweries are measured in terms of what are known as their brew length. That is to say how much beer they can produce in one run of making beer. Uh, in our case, uh, the biggest vessels that you can see behind me over here, these are 200 litre vessels. Um, so that doesn't mean to say we produce 200 litres of beer every time we brew, um, because you need head space to allow the beer to boil. Um, and so typically we're producing about 120 litres of beer every time we brew. Um, so, you know, at our very maximum, we're, we're kind of almost sort of one American uh, barrel. We're not quite big enough for a, a UK barrel, but we're getting close. Um, and uh, therefore, we don't produce a lot of beer for a day's work. Now, the important thing is, again, why you measure a brewery in terms of its brew length um, it is simply because um, it takes the same amount of effort to actually brew 100 litres of beer as it does really to, produ to produce 100,000 litres of beer. Um, as long as you take out the, the time it takes to actually heat up the volume of liquid, it's pretty much the same process. Uh, you just use bigger heaters and bigger vessels and more ingredients and essentially it's the same thing. So it's the same amount of effort regardless of, of how much you're brewing. Uh, and basically, yeah, we, we have a relatively small amount that we can brew each time. Uh, so for a day's work, we'll produce about uh, 120 litres of beer. Um, on a commercial scale, that is not enough beer to make it commercially viable. Um, so I don't have here a commercially viable brewery. What I do have, though, is a commercial brewery. That is to say, I am registered and licensed to sell what I produce. That's why we are commercial. Um, so what on earth am I doing in commercial? Um, uh, and the answer, it was kind of I alluded to it earlier, which is uh, I'm a bit of a home brewer that got out of control. 
Um, you know, I, I started off really, I, I was always interested, I don't know quite why, but I was always interested in uh, how beer was brewed. I liked beer. Um, and uh, having got into trouble a lot at school for drinking, um, basically, I, uh, I, the first opportunity I got, which uh, was when I first uh, owned uh, or was renting a house, uh, which coincided with getting married, it wasn't because I was married that I decided to brew beer, um, I then basically started brewing beer. And I did what everybody did at the time, which is you pop down to Boots, uh, and you buy yourself a, a fermenting bin uh, and you take a one and a half or one kilo uh, syrup kit off of the shelf. Uh, you open it up with a can opener. You pour it into your fermenting bin. You add some water. You sprinkle on the yeast. You wait a week until all the bubbles cease to rise. You siphon it off into some plastic uh, bottles. Uh, about as long as you can, which is usually a couple of hours before you try the beer. <laughs> and then you go, mm, interesting, that's definitely alcoholic, but I'm not sure I'd call that beer. Um, <laughs> so my first question when I started homebrewing was, why doesn't this taste like what I you know, have in the pub? There's clearly some difference. And there, sort of, now it must be, what, 27 years ago, um, I basically started asking the question, why is what I'm brewing not the same as what I can get in a pub? In other words, commercially, what are they doing differently? Um, and so really started a lifetime passion to understand what was required. Um, and so I started doing some research uh, and uh, as time went by, I, I realized the only way to brew really good quality beer um, was in fact to go back to brewing it from grain and not, not syrups. Um, and so this is the stuff we brew beer from. Uh, this is a pale malt. Uh, this one is a crystal malt. It's slightly darker. And finally, this is an example here um, of a black malt. So um, different malts. Uh, I spoke at length on Tuesday about how and what the different uh, malts are used for. Um, so um, in terms of uh, what the only way really to brew really good quality beer is to use uh, brewing from malt and effectively brewing beer is like making a good cup of tea. You steep the tea leaves in hot water for a period of time, uh, then you pour out the tea. Uh, you add a bit of milk if you're so inclined or a bit of lemon uh, to adjust the flavor, maybe some sugar if that's what you want in it. And hey, presto, you've got your nice cup of tea. And, and brewing beer is kind of much the same. We take the grain, uh, we steep the grain in water. Uh, we then actually add something else, which is called hops. We add yeast. The yeast then basically turns the sugars uh, that were in the liquid that we've extracted from the grain uh, and produce CO2 and alcohol, and that's your beer. That's fundamentally nailed down to the process. Um, and uh, really, I, I began to brew. Um, and uh, I got very frustrated pretty quick because I didn't have much success until I actually went on a one-day course down in London in commercial brewing. It was a kind of it was an advanced homebrew course. Uh, run by, I think it was Sunderland University in a pub in London. Um, that totally transformed my brewing. I uh, bought a little bit of equipment and then started brewing at home. Um, rapidly got kicked out of the kitchen by my wife after it all boiled over and, and encrusted on the oven. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, not to mention the times when it, it, it actually, I got this lovely uh, dark brown precipitate all over the kitchen ceiling, which meant that the actually the kitchen needed redecorating. Uh, <laughs> so no surprise that I got kicked out of there into the utility room. Um, and then from the utility room moved out to the greenhouse. Um, so uh, basically equipment got bigger and things got a bit more out of control. So why did I turn into home brewing uh, or from home brewing into commercial? The answer was because I actually got fed up of uh, eventually people saying, can I buy your beer? Um, and I would say, no, you can't buy my beer, but here's a few bottles. Um, and, uh, I, I, you know, you know, you go to a party, you take along some beer. I went to an event, I would take along some beer. Uh, and more and more people would say to me, OK, how do I get hold of your beer? It's really nice. And I think there were a couple of things that really changed it for me. Um, I took some beer down to a local beer festival in Burwell 
Uh, and the guy that was running the festival uh, tasted the beer uh, and uh, he said, you know what, that's better than anything that we've actually got currently at the festival. Uh, can you provide us with some? And I said, no, I'm just a home brewer. <laughs> um, also, uh, somebody that we knew that um, took over the lease in one of the pubs uh, said to us, basically, he tasted the beer and said, basically, uh, he would be prepared to put that beer behind the bar. Could I provide him with some? And again, I had to say no. Um, and he said, well, why don't you turn commercial and uh, you know, I'll buy a beer? Uh, and that got me thinking. Um, so uh, I then started redoing the research. I thought, well, there's a lot of difference between brewing at home uh, and, uh, you know, obviously commercial breweries. Um, some of the difference are is, you know, at home you can produce a different beer each time and it doesn't matter. As long as it's nice, as long as you're enjoying it, no big shades. When you're brewing commercially, you've got to be able to brew consistently. Um, people expect that the beer labelled with Judy's Hole tastes like Judy's Hole the next time. <laughs> they don't expect it to taste like something that's entirely different. Um, and so you need a degree of consistency, not just in, in, in flavour, but in colour and in alcohol uh, content and so on. So you've got to brew consistently. Um, and also you've got to brew at scale because you're going to be selling it. You're not brewing 40 pints at a time. You're, you know, it could be 400 or 4,000 pints at a time. Um, and so mistakes are costly. Um, so you need to be able to control the process. And so I went uh, and... Uh, put myself onto a, a commercial brewing course for a week, uh, did the certificate in international uh, brewing uh, and came back and realized, of course, I didn't know a great deal about beer, um, <laughs> but came back a lot wiser uh, and basically started brewing. So that's kind of how I got started. Um, now, I noticed there was a question that came up, so I'm just going to briefly pause in case there are any other questions on uh, why I started brewing or any other related questions. That of course is really an excuse for me to drink beer whilst I'm not <laughs> talking. Well justified as well I'd say that's it's been very interesting so far. The, <laughs> the one question that was up there was about how do you uh, uh, put beer into a, a cask uh, and one of the, uh, the guys behind us, Bert, did, did answer that by uh, saying it's no problem, it's one of the easiest steps. You put beer in the cask, hit the bung with a hammer until it stops leaking. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> yeah. um, so it depends. I think with, yeah. with home, with, well, my very limited home brewing, I never really got as far as a cask apart from a, a plastic pressure barrel from Boots, as you as you pointed out earlier on. So uh, yeah. uh, uh, that was just pouring it in. Um, oh, uh, we have a, a comment uh, for just from uh, uh, from David saying we have people on Facebook watching from Poland and Munich. So. Uh, be well, good to uh, explain how to make beer to those in Munich in particular, I'd have thought. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be so presumptuous, yeah. yes. I'm not talking about how to make British beers, but they make excellent beer in Munich, as we well know, and indeed Poland, so yes. Um, okay, oh, well... Oh, uh, so we do have one question, it's very pertinent, is which beer are you drinking, Ricky? <laughs> I'm drinking befuddled tonight I think as Jonathan said uh, it's a little bit too warm perhaps for a dark beer uh, we do brew seasonal beers um, so uh, thanks for the plug by the way uh, <laughs> this this one here is Judy's Hole which is our dark beer uh, and uh, this basically we originally only ever brewed it in the winter um, but people like Jonathan liked it so much they persuaded us to, to brew it all year round and actually it's our biggest seller so dark beers, um, we actually brew it now through the, through the, uh, the warmer months uh, at only about 4.5% rather than 6.5% ABV. Um, I'm drinking uh, Befuggled. Um, so Befuggled is a typical English bitter, so it's quaffable pale ale. Um, the other one we've actually got on at the brewery at the moment uh, is, uh, is this one. This is Stefan's Müller, which is a, uh, a Bavarian wheat beer. There you go, the guys in Munich. It's a Bavarian wheat beer. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with differences in wheat beer, really there are two types, Bavarian wheat beer and Belgian wheat beer. The Belgian wheat beer or wit beer um, it tends to have an addition of uh, things like orange peel and coriander, whereas the uh, Bavarian sticks firmly to the Reinhardt which is basically uh, you put your malt, your water, your hops and your yeast, and that better be all you put in your beer. 
Um, so uh, that's basically it. Um, so we, we brew a wheat beer, which is a Bavarian wheat beer. Um, we've also actually just tonight transferred uh, some uh, IPA, some American IPA, which is very popular from the fermenter into our conditioning tanks. Um, so that's it, but cheers. I'm drinking Befuggled at the moment, um, which is uh, very refreshing the heat. Um, thank you for your question. <laughs> uh, th thanks, thanks, Ricky. By the way, your, your, uh, your internet connection seems a little bit flaky tonight, so I don't know if you're yeah. able to give it a kick. Uh, or I think it's yours, not mine, but uh, you are breaking up a little bit from time to time. Okay. Uh, I don't think there's a great deal I'm going to be uh, able to do about that. I could switch onto another wireless network, but I'm not sure it'd be, a, uh, be any better. I've just got a message saying the audio is fine for attendees. So my apologies yeah. if the video go goes in and out. Uh, but I am in the brewery and we are at the top of the garden. So, uh, yeah. you know, we're a little bit far from the router. Um, I'm not going to bore you with all the IT stuff. So. <laughs> no, that, well, I'd agree with that. But the audio is generally fine. The video freezes sometimes, that's all. Okay, great. All right. Um, so uh, basically, uh, why am I brewing at the top of my garden instead of an, on an industrial estate? And the answer was um, because my commercial training taught me that to be commercially viable, you need to have a brewery which is at least 10 barrel brew length. OK. Um, so a barrel, uh, you know, in terms of a, 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 uh, a UK barrel, I think is 266 pints. Um, we brew closer to sort of 200, somewhere between 200 and 250 pints each time. We need to be 10 times the size to be commercially viable. What is commercially viable? Can I draw a salary as well as pay for all of the ingredients, the rent, the depreciation, the rates and everything else that goes with running a business? Um, at the size that we are, we cannot possibly pay salaries. We just don't produce enough beer ever to uh, basically produce a decent return uh, to pay a salary. So I brew for the love of it. Um, so I have a full-time job elsewhere. Um, and so I, I, I come up to the brewery at sort of 6.30 in the morning and I tend to work in the brewery sort of 6.30 till 8.30 in the morning. Then I go to my day job, then I come back, then I come up to the brewery again. Uh, and there's uh, two of us, myself and Paul, uh, we, uh, we do the brewery and we are now at the moment brewing every single weekend and sometimes uh, we are brewing in the week as well. Um, and uh, yeah, basically we don't draw any salary, um, but we brew because we love brewing. We brew because people enjoy our beer. So our aim when we set up the brewery was, hey, do you know what? If we could actually make this hobby break even so that we can have fun brewing beer, drink a bit of beer with friends, uh, share beer around and make sure everybody enjoys really good beer, that'll be fine. So we didn't set out uh, really to, to make any money out of the venture. Um, in terms of why I'm brewing in my garden, not an industrial estate, um, that is simply because uh, when I started looking at the cost of renting a unit in industrial estate, uh, or indeed just about anything anywhere else, uh, it basically meant we would be end up brewing just to pay the, the, the rates, uh, which we didn't want to do. Um, so uh, I happen to have a reasonably sized garden. Uh, and so I decided I was going to actually uh, build the brewery myself. Uh, and so uh, I built the brewery myself um, and uh, we actually now brew at the top of my garden, which is wonderful because the reality is there's no other way I could do it running a job that has me working 50 hours a week. Uh, Paul, my business partner, uh, regularly is over in California, so he's uh, equally working hard on his main job. Uh, and we're basically brewing beer because we love beer and we love brewing beer. Um, that's fundamentally us. But there are some realities too which is if you're going to do what we're doing and try and turn your hobby into something which is pretty much neutral or maybe pays a little bit of money, um, then how do you go about doing it? Um, well, the first thing to say is if you have a commercial premises at the bottom of your garden, it is a commercial premises. Uh, you will need planning permission. Don't be put off by the fact that you need planning permission. Getting planning permission uh, was not particularly difficult for the brewery. Essentially, what the uh, planning officers want to know is how much noise are you going to make? 
Uh, are you going to pollute anything? Are you going to upset anybody in terms of what you're doing? Or is there any other reason why putting up the building you plan to put up is going to cause a problem? If the answer is no, they are more than happy to grant you permission. So my advice is build a nice building. <laughs> Um, so the building that I built uh, is a, effectively a garden studio. Uh, it has, uh, if you look on our Facebook page, uh, Burwell Brewery, search Facebook Burwell Brewery, uh, you will see the building, you will see lots of pictures of Paul and I uh, and friends uh, actually putting up the building. We have concrete floors, uh, it's a timber framed structure uh, that then is clad out uh, in uh, cedar. Um, so it's a, a beautiful building and I made it beautiful because I have to look at it every day from my house. <laughs> um, so uh, it, it's, it's a lovely building and it's all insulated uh, to, to a high standard simply because then it doesn't cost me anything to heat it and it really doesn't cost me anything to heat it. Um, so that's broadly speaking why I have it in my garden. Um, in terms of what else did I have to do, uh, in terms of what hoops did I have to jump through? Um, getting planning consent was relatively easy. The other things you have to do, and I thought, oh, great, you know, I've been on a commercial brewing course. What I'll do is I, all I need to do is I, I register with HMRC uh, and basically I pay my duty and that's actually what I need to do to be a commercial brewer. Um, unfortunately, it's not quite that simple um, because uh, yes, I registered with HMRC, uh, and uh, then basically I started selling my beer. Um, no problem, I thought, I'm paying my duty, everybody's happy, I've got a commercial premises. Um, the next thing, of course, is that um, I happen to know some people who were on the uh, Cambridge Beer Festival Committee, uh, and so basically, uh, you know, I, I spoke to them, uh, and they said, yeah, we'd, we'd love to have and love to support you, and I got introduced to Jonathan uh, through the Burwell Museum, uh, and uh, basically, uh, you know, camera kindly pointed out to me that uh, can you provi provide us with your alcohol warehouse reference number? And they don't know this, but I sat there and thought, well, I've got dozens of numbers that were issued by HMRC. I wonder which one of them is, is, is that one. Um, and I looked through all these different numbers that they'd given me. Not one of them was an alcohol warehouse reference number. So I thought, well, it's no problem. We've got about six weeks until the, till, <laughs> till the Winter Beer Festival. Um, I'll just apply. So I went online and I applied and, uh, and Julie HMRC say, OK, fine, we need to come and visit you. So they come and visit me um, and they say to me, OK, fine. What we need you to do is we need to we need you to provide us with uh, basically evidence that you are going to be selling beer. So if you can provide any emails from pubs or anywhere else that indicates that somebody might want to buy your beer, um, so that we know that you're actually a genuine institute that's trading, a company that's trading, you're not laundering money. Um, that's what we need from you. Okay, great, no problem, I thought. Uh, I will just provide them with the invoices for all the beer that I've sold because that genuinely shows that I'm trading. <laughs> At which point uh, they read me a caution uh, and told me that basically I shouldn't be trading, uh, basically because of course uh, I don't have an alcohol warehouse reference number. Um, at which point I said, oh, that's odd, because I went on a commercial brewing course and they didn't mention it. Uh, and they said, when did you do your you know, course? And I said, oh, about 12 months ago. And they said, well, the reason why they didn't mention it is because you didn't need one of those 12 months ago. So I said, oh, that's interesting. So why, when I registered with HMRC, did you not tell me I needed one of these? And they said, oh, well, that's a different department. <laughs> um, uh, so I said, well, how would one know that you needed to do this? And they said, yeah. That's the difficulty. Um, we weren't quite sure how to tell anybody, um, so we didn't. Um, so, uh, you know, in fairness to the guys, they were really nice uh, and they basically said, look, um, we're taking a very lenient attitude with things right now. Um, so uh, basically just provide us with your information and don't worry about it, we'll get this pushed through, um, which they did. Um, so there were no issues. Um, so, um, Basically, uh, I can see there's just a question that's come through. Uh, basically, uh, is there a specific amount of beer you're allowed to brew uh, or you must brew, I think, perhaps as a commercial brewery? No. Um, as a, there are, there are different, there's a small brewer, 
Um, you are a small brewer and entitled for small brewery relief on the duty you pay. I think it's 5,000 hectolitres a year. It certainly was an amount that I never worried about. So I pay, I think, £9.54 duty per... It's a bit more complicated than just hectolitre because it depends, that's per percentage alcohol point. Um, so you pay a, a lower rate if you're a small brewer. If you're a, a brewer brewing more than 5,000 hectolitres, you pay a, a, a about double that. Um, but other than that, you can produce any amount you like. You just have to pay duty on every bit of beer you produce. Note, not what you sell, <laughs> what you produce. Um, so you have beer that's in suspension, i.e. I haven't yet paid duty on it um, because I haven't sold it. But once I've sold it, it comes out of suspension, duty suspension, and I have to go ahead and pay duty on that. Um, and we submit, we submit a return to uh, HMRC at the end of every month, which tells them how much beer I've sold, what the alcohol content was of each beer, uh, and I duly then buy a direct debit so I don't forget, I pay my uh, uh, duty. Um, so that's that one. Um, that wasn't the only thing from a, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the um, legal side of things. Of course, we're a food production unit. So as a food production unit, you have to be inspected by local government. So they will come in, they will inspect your premises for a food hygiene inspection. What do they want to know? They want to know that you are producing a product safely, hygienically. Um, so you have to produce something called a HACCP plan, a hazard analysis and a critical control point plan. Um, so the best way to get one of those is to pay an organization to provide you with a template. I paid, I think, about 200 pounds for a template uh, that was produced by an organization, uh, basically that specialized in producing these for microbreweries. I then read through it, adapted it to reflect the way in which we plan to cooperate, uh, branded it and sent it off to environmental health. They were very happy. Um, so they came and duly inspected us. They talked to us, we talked about what we did. Uh, they listened diligently. Uh, they made some recommendations on things that we could change to improve things. We said, thank you very much. We got five stars and away we went. Um, bear in mind that we use 304 stainless steel throughout the process, closed systems transfers. Um, both uh, Paul and myself work in the pharmaceutical industry sectors. We are used to writing SOPs. We are used to working in a regulated industry. The standards we are used to working to far exceed what the food industry need. Um, so for us, this was a bit of a no-brainer. We can talk the talk, we can walk the walk. <laughs> um, but we do, uh, you know, uh, we are meticulous about cleaning and we are meticulous about sterilization and, and what we do. We have spent, a, you know, a good proportion of our startup capital has gone on really top quality stainless steel and, and food grade pumps and so on. Um, it is important you get a problem with your beer and start making people ill, you are out of business, okay? <laughs> so it's as simple as that. Um, so we had no problems with, uh, with uh, the health and safety from a food standards perspective. I, great, I then started, no problem, I can sell my beer, I can produce beer, I can sell it um, you know, at a camera festival, fantastic. I provide camera with my alcohol warehouse reference number um, and we're all good. And we have great success at, at the Winter Beer Festivals, at the, uh, the Cambridge Winter Beer, Beer Festival at the end of last year, followed by the Ely Winter Beer Festival. Everybody loves the beer. Paul and I turn up to the, uh, the beer festival the day after it starts to find our beers sold out. Big disappointment, we can't drink our own beer at the festival, but never mind. <laughs> um, so no problems, everything is going well. We're mainly concentrating at this point on selling our beer uh, to festivals and to uh, organizations in the village who otherwise wouldn't put on real ale. Hence, Burwell Museum, the Burwell Sports Club, Burwell Cricket Club. We're supporting one or two people who are doing parties and things like that and raising money in the village. And, you know, frankly, yeah, it was great because Paul and I just brewed once a month. 
um, and everything's going fine. This is my hobby and I'm, I'm selling a bit of beer on the side. Um, uh, then basically uh, I get invited, would you like to go and do the farmer's market? Yeah, I would like to do the farmer's market. I guess we ought to put it in bottles. <laughs> Um, so we go and put it in bottles and we do we did beer boxes which are like wine boxes but we were doing those and so let's let's put it in some bottles so I order bottles and I realize the only way to buy bottles is to actually buy them in bulk otherwise you pay a ridiculous price um, so I basically look up all my contacts for my commercial brewing course um, I get my contact and I ring them up and I order some bottles and the smallest quantity they do in is a pallet of bottles this being nearly 1300 bottles they duly turn up because I can't order any smaller. Uh, and they, they arrive on the doorstep and Paul and I take a photograph and post it up on Facebook saying, this is a laugh, I've got 1300 bottles, that'll last me forever. Um, and we bottle up, uh, you know, six crates uh, of beer. So, um, you know, we bottled up uh, some beer and we take it across to the, uh, to the farmer's market and it happens to be December. Naively, I have no idea what this means for beer sales. <laughs> so we go in there with about, we'll say six, six uh, boxes of, uh, of 12 bottles. We sell out of beer in about the first hour and a half. So meanwhile, we scrabble around trying to bottle beer and get it back to the, uh, the farmer's market in time before the farmer's market ends. Um, and realize this bottling beer and selling it to, to the public is absolutely great. There's only one small problem uh, is that we actually discover uh, that we uh, can't sell beer to the public without two small things. Um, one is that actually, of course, you need to have a premises license. Um, without a premises license, the fact that we're not actually selling beer from our premises, we're selling it from another premises that has a premises license. <laughs> That's not the point. <laughs> They've got a premises license, but we don't. We're trading the beer from our premises. We don't have a premises license. We need a premises license. To get a premises license, you need somebody who actually has an alcohol license. Um, so basically, when you look in a pub, you will always see above the bar or somewhere in the pub, there will be a little sign which tells you who actually holds the alcohol license for that premises. It's the premises license holder. Um, they are the people who understand uh, the legal implications, the law surrounding alcohol sales and are ultimately responsible for the alcohol that's sold. Um, so they know exactly who they can sell alcohol to under which circumstances uh, and what they should put in place in order to minimize uh, any social uh, issues uh, that might result from it. Uh, and any problems that might result from the sale of alcohol. So you have to then go and you have to sit a course, take an exam and basically get your alcohol premises license by then taking your certificate and applying for an alcohol premises license where duly the uh, police tell me I now have to install CCTV in my premises and I have to install an alarm um, after I've built the premises. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I have to, I now have CCTV and an alarm system on my building because it's the only way I can comply with my premises license. Note, I do not, I know, I don't, I have, whilst I have a bar on the premises, I have deliberately chosen not to actually sell alcohol on the premises. My license, I deliberately chose to sell alcohol for consumption off of the premises. And that is because I am in a residential area. I don't think it is fair on my neighbors. Uh, I think they would worry uh, if we actually had a license that enabled us effectively to run a pub from my back garden. So out of consideration for them, not because it was going to be a problem for the council, um, but out of consideration for them, I don't. Uh, so if you actually ever visit the brewery, um, then basically it's by appointment only. And I'm afraid guys, you have to sit in the bar and drink for free because I can't sell it to you on the premises. I thought that was a win-win, frankly. Um, of course, if you choose to buy some beer and then take it off the premises, that's good for me. <laughs> um, but most people have no complaints about that, but that was my personal decision. I will say the council were incredibly helpful and have been every step of the way. Um, from uh, you know everything from my premises application 
To my premises license, I have found the council incredibly helpful and supportive, supportive over what I'm doing. So anything you hear about the fact that, oh, it's so difficult to do isn't actually true. Yes, there's paperwork. Yes, there's effort involved. Stick with it, plod through it. The council I found, the East, East Cam's District Council up at Ely, I could not praise them enough. They were incredibly helpful. And that is a good point. If there's some Q&A, uh, what have we got, Jonathan? Um, at the moment, there's been one or two things that have come through. I've tried to answer one. Somebody uh, did ask, what is an SOP? Um, yep. And in my world, it's a standard operating procedure. So I'm assuming it's the same in yours. It is um, exactly the same in mine, yes. So uh, we've answered that one. Um, uh, somebody else, this is one which is quite good, is how can you buy beer from Bur uh, Burwell? Um, we've pointed people yep. at your, web, uh, your Facebook page. Is that right? That is absolutely right. We are in the process of setting up a website with online sales as well. Um, but uh, yeah, for now, go to the Facebook page uh, and uh, basically from there, uh, you can then just message me and Paul and I will answer any questions you've got and arrange to have your beer. Um, so Jonathan uh, orders beer from us. Uh, it's becoming regularly, I think it's fair to say. Um, <laughs> So uh, we have a number of people in Cambridge, but we also have, you know, most of our customer course comes from Burwell and surrounding villages. But uh, absolutely talk to us. You can buy our beer. Great stuff. And then we've, we've got a couple of questions from uh, Colin Dewar, which are not directly related to how you run your the brewery, but are actually about yeah. recipes. Sure. So, uh, maybe you can pick those up. The first one is, do you use mains or RO water to start with? Yeah, OK. We use mains water. So what you do, um, and actually most commercial breweries are doing exactly the same. Uh, the original the original sort of uh, essence of why water was so important was because uh, all you could do was draw the water up from where you locally were and use that water. Of course, now, uh, you know, a brewery can strip its water back of all chemicals into a dis into distilled water. They can add whatever salts, minerals, chemicals, balance the pH to whatever they want to the water and then use it. Um, so the reason why, you know, you can buy tiger, brew, tiger beer brewed in Bedford is because actually they can analyze the water from the original breweries. Uh, they can then basically reproduce the water. So you don't have to have water from Burton-on-Trent to brew an IPA. Um, so what we did uh, is we sent our water off for analysis um, and when that came back, uh, what we got, this is Murphy and Sons, they do water analysis. Uh, we got that back and they gave us a specifications sheet. Um, and they also kindly told us if you add, uh, for the type of beers you want to brew, you add this and you add that, which you can purchase from us. <laughs> um, and, uh, and that's what you need to do to balance your water. And that's exactly what we do. Um, so we use that specification sheet uh, and basically we then uh, take the, the water. What I do do is I run it off into, uh, the, uh, into our hot liquor tank. Uh, I'll just wander over here, by the way. This is the hot liquor tank. 200 litre hot liquor tank, okay, is over here. This is a mash tun. That basically is where you steep the grain in the hot water. This is a kettle. The difference between this and this is the name. That's all. Uh, this heats up hot water. This one heats up what is known as wort, which is the beer that comes out of the mash tun. Um, so we will run this off. Uh, the night before, we will put the water in here. I'll leave the lid off. And the reason why I run the, uh, take the lid off is it allows the chlorine to evaporate because there'll be chlorine uh, in your water. Um, so that allows the chlorine to evaporate. That's the biggest thing you can ever do to your water to treat it. You don't have to use any chemicals at all, just leave the lid off overnight. If you want to, you can also boil it the night before, leave it to stand, because uh, that way basically um, the calcium carbonate will, will begin to precipitate out, because um, we get hard water in this area. Um, uh, and basically, um, then anything else you do is entirely up to you. Um, we basically then add a couple of chemicals. One is uh, called AMS, the other one is DWB. And if you send your water off for analysis by Murphy and Son, they will come back and tell you exactly what quantities you need to add to brew bitters, IPAs, or whatever other beer style you want to do. And that's what we do to our water. Simple as that. Excellent. I, lo I love the great philanthropy of, uh, of was it Murphy and Son? 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes, yes. Just buy this from us, and it'll all be all fine. Okay. The That's second right. question on recipes. So there was. Um, uh, uh, Colin says he's made several brews that tasted great in the fermenter, but then lost a lot of flavour in the bottle. Have you got right. any tips to retain the flavours? Um, that's a difficult one to answer because I probably have to look at the whole, you know, the, the process between fermenter and bottling. Let me tell you what we do. Um, I think the first thing we do is we go from the fermenter closed system transfer into a conditioning tank and it sits in the conditioning tank for, uh, you know, jo all joking aside, about as long as I can keep it in there. Um, the reason why I say as long as I can keep it in there is because people keep asking me, can I buy your beer? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I keep it in there and I'm allowing it to naturally clear and condition. I taste it periodically. It's a tough job, but somebody's got to do it. Um, and uh, when I'm happy with the beer, it goes out. It's as simple as that. Sometimes that's a week and sometimes it's, it's three weeks. Um, what we then do is take it off the conditioning tank and put it into the bottle. I don't use spray malt. I don't add sugar or anything else to the bottles. It's conditioned in the tank. It goes into the bottle. Now, very occasionally, I get feedback from somebody that says, your beer's flat. Um, well, at which point I say, well, if you leave it in the bottle for a little bit longer, it's going to build up some condition. Why? Because there's yeast in it. It will build up more condition. If you want a fizzier beer, <laughs> if you must, Leave it in the bottle for longer, it will begin to build up some carbonation. Um, but I, I personally like to, you know, if I'm going to bottle the beer, when I pour it out the bottle, I want it to be like it's come out of my hand pump. Um, so I don't want it overly carbonated. I want enough carbonation only to really keep the beer in good condition because it's got a layer of CO2 over it. Other things that we're doing uh, with the beer uh, is that we actually have a beer gun from uh, Blitchman. Um, the basically in CO2 cylinders. I fill the bottle with CO2. I fill it then with uh, the uh, beer that's conditioned in the tank. And then I top it with CO2 and then I cap it. So what we are aiming to do is minimize the oxygen in the beer throughout the whole process. Um, so you want oxygen in the, in the beer when you're fermenting and then you don't want oxygen anywhere near the beer because it basically begins to oxidize and produces acetic acid, which is uh, not generally desirable, certainly not in large quantities. Um, so essentially that process seems to do pretty good at, at, at retaining all the beers in the flavor. What happens, of course, in conditioning, when you take it out of the fermenter, um, the flavors are quite harsh. Um, you'll probably find if it's come, it comes out of the fermenter, it may be overly bitter. There may be harsh flavors in there. When you put it in the conditioning tank and leave it, uh, then basically all those flavors mellow and it, and it softens. Uh, and so then when it comes out of the conditioning tank, it's in perfect drinking condition. So it may well be you need to adjust your recipes um, to, to get a bit more bitterness in the beer, a bit more aroma in the beer. Um, what you taste as it comes out the fermenter is not the taste that really you're going for. Um, you're after something, you've got to accept the fact that it will soften because the hop oils will begin to evaporate over time. Therefore, the, um, you know, the aroma will decrease. Um, so experiment with your recipe a little bit. Uh, improve your bottling technique might help. Quite happy to talk to you offline, Colin. Uh, and, and let's have a discussion about what you're currently doing offline. It does sound like it's that conditioning stage is the key to, to that, that answer, isn't it? So thank you very much for that, Ricky. Yeah, um, no There are no other questions open at the moment, so I'd encourage anybody who's got any, any other questions just to put them in if they can. I've got yeah. a nice comment uh, from Pete and Andy. I think it's probably from Pete saying he's now on the Stefan's Muller and it's a lovely wheat beer. So a uh, bit of a promotion right. for you there. This is good. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I know. Um, if, if, now, Peter and myself were a couple of the people who came up to see you a few weeks ago. So uh, then saw Brilliant. the saw the first run of the Stefan's Muller, I think, didn't we? So indeed, yes, you did. Yes, our experimental batch. So great. Um, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about um, things like. Uh, let's answer a question first about can I brew beer in my kitchen and sell it commercially? Uh, yes, you can. Um, which is what we did first of all when we had environmental health here. Uh, we talked them through brewing in our kitchen because the brewery wasn't finished. Um, and uh, again, I would encourage you to ring up the lady from Environmental Health. She's wonderful. 
I, I talked her through what I was trying to achieve uh, and she taught me through what I needed to do. And I asked the questions like, can I do this? Can I do that? Is it all right if I do this? You know, again, th th this myth, I think, that environmental health of these nasty people trying to stop people trading is just not true. Mm. Um, you know, what they want to see is that you're trading as safely as possible. Um, that's their concern. And so as long as you're willing to work with them, they will work with you. Um, so, yeah, you can brew in your kitchen commercially if you really want to do so. And you can brew 40 pints of beer and have a commercial license. No yeah. problem at all. The, you know, commercially, nobody cares how much you brew. That's entirely up to you. You don't have to be a profitable business. <laughs> OK, um, so let's talk a little bit perhaps about equipment that I've got. If somebody says, you know, I really fancy setting up a, a, something like yours. Um, what's it going to cost me? What do I need? If you are going to brew beer like a commercial brewery does, and there is no other way uh, to actually get that sort of quality and control into your beer, you will need what I've got behind me here, okay? You will need three vessels, ideally. You can make do with two. If you must, you can make do with one vessel, okay? Um, so I may do for a number of years with one vessel from brew packs. Uh, basically, it was a single vessel which, in which I heated up the water, I added my grain, I set it to 65 degrees, I mashed my beer, uh, and then basically I took the, hop, the, the bag out which had the grain in and basically boiled it up and added my hops, and that's how I brewed beer. Um, the problem with that, of course, is that you're not going to get exactly the quality and you can't control everything that a, a commercial brewer would. Um, but if you look at some of the systems out there, um, basically they have everything in one vessel and that's essentially what they're doing. That's better than necessarily uh, opening a can and pouring a can of syrup, but it's not going to produce commercial quality and commercial quality controls. What you ideally need is a minimum of two vessels. Uh, you can heat your water in one of the vessels, transfer it into an insulated vessel, which could be, uh, you know, an ice box of some description, anything which is insulated. Uh, basically use that uh, basically to mash the beer, run it off of that back into the vessel that you had the hot water in. <laughs> um, or you put it off into a plastic bin. I put some down there so you can see off into a plastic bin and basically from the plastic bin you then empty the vessel uh, that you're planning to then pour it back into because the water goes out the vessel into the mash tun out the mash tun as you what's called sparge you flush it with a shower of hot water into the plastic bins uh, and then basically once that process is complete you then pour the wort back into the original vessel heat it up and basically away you go. But if anybody would like to talk to us again in more detail about how do I really do a full mash brew, I'm quite happy to talk to people about full mash brewing. Um, ideally though, for, for efficiency, you have three vessels. And so basically I'm, I am running the hot water off into the mash tun. It goes from the mash tun out and gets pumped into the kettle. Uh, once it's in the kettle, then I'm actually bringing that up to the boil and I can actually make a batch of beer into the fermenter in about four hours. Um, so that's essentially what I'm doing. Um, and uh, that's really the setup you need. You don't need vessels that are 200 litres. OK, um, you do need a kettle that is about twice the size of the amount you want to brew. So if you want to brew 20 litres of beer, get a 40 litre kettle. Um, because when you get it into a rolling boil, you need the headspace. Um, so that's my advice on equipment. Lots more I could say about equipment, but we'll have to do that uh, in another session. So what yeah. I want to do is because we've got a few minutes left, uh, because I want to make sure we stop on time uh, so that those that want to support the NHS and other key workers can do so. Uh, I'm going to kick it over to questions. Uh, so any any other questions? We do have one open at the moment, and it's one I know uh, I know the answer to, but I know you'll answer it much better than I can, which is why Judy's Hole? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Judy's Hole, uh, we try to name our beers after local places. Um, so all of our beers are either uh, really named based upon something that either was happening locally or, or uh, place names. Judy's Hole is a, uh, a place in Burwell um, that basically was used for swimming. Um, uh, and hence, it's a it's a, a nice 
clear stretch of, of water, and almost certainly very cold. Uh, a local beauty spot. Judy was a wise woman that was actually lived in the cottage that overlooks Judy's Hole. Uh, and essentially, we just like to keep things local. And so we called it Judy's Hole. We quite like the innuendo too. Yeah. There you go. Any other questions? There's nothing open at the moment. There's some very nice comments about the beer, uh, but particularly yeah. about uh, the wheat beer. Um, uh, I mean, I just like to thank you for the for the uh, discussion again. I mean, I suppose one question I, I'd sort of immediately think is: you've told us which what vessels you need. Can you give us some indication about how much these vessels cost? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, depends where you buy them from. Is this is the answer? Um, so the uh, big vessels that we've got, the two hundred liter ones, you're looking. Uh, the vessels themselves are only about 250 quid, but then you've got to put heating elements and temperature controls in them. You're looking about 550 pounds for 200 litre vessels kitted out as we have. We happen to have uh, 11 kilowatts of, of heaters in them. We have two five and a half kilowatt heaters. You can't run a five and a half kilowatt heater off of your domestic supply. You have to have dedicated circuits. Um, but you could have a three kilowatt heater. Um, so buy three kilowatt heaters. The mash ton happens to be from SS Brewtech. That's about 500 quid all kitted out. The fermentation tank we've got is from SS Brewtech. That's about 1200 quid. Uh, and then you get into conditioning tanks, which all kitted out at about 1000 quid a piece and a glycol chiller, which is about 1200 quid. Um, it isn't cheap if you're going to kit yourself out with decent kit, but you can do it cheaper. Oh, thank you very much, Ricky. And um, that's that's really helpful. Um, th there aren't any other questions open, and I think we've only got about two or three minutes left before yeah. the uh, the NHS clap. So um, I'd just like to thank you again for a very fascinating talk, and uh, and the continuing supply of Judas Hole is most uh, yeah. most appreciated. Um, but as I say, the lighter rails are also good there, so maybe some befuggled is the next next order. Great. Um, I'm just checking to see uh, what's going on here. Um, uh, oh, yes, just some announcements. Um, well, first of all, obviously, thank you. Uh, um, anybody who's planning to join the Three Blind Mice uh, discussion later on, it's just been cancelled. I have no other information, but uh, don't bother trying to dial into that. It's not going to happen. Okay. Um, but, uh, well, thank you for everybody joining the uh, the virtual beer festival. It's such a shame. You know, the weather arrived, but uh, yeah. unfortunately we can't do it. But uh, looking forward to the winter festival, and uh, we'll see you all there. Thanks again, okay. Ricky. No problem. Thank you very much. And happy to talk uh, through Facebook or uh, directly later on. So uh, thank you very much. Cheerio. Bye.